he suddenly realized that prisons and jails are these institutions which are very hidden from the public view, very intentionally hidden away from the public view. What happens behind prison walls or jail walls is not very apparent. And so for that reason, people are very fascinated by it. But it's also really important to talk about. It's really important for us to know what happens in those public institutions, in part because you know, we're paying for it. So your parents or you know, anyone who's paying taxes on some level is paying for our prison and jail system. So it's important for us just to know what takes place. Um, specific to what you're studying, one of the things that I witnessed is that our prison and jail system contends with an enormous number of health issues, and especially chronic health issues. So the prison and jail system is filled largely with people who come from our most vulnerable and poor communities. 80% of people who are criminal defendants who are accused of a crime in our court system are too poor to afford a lawyer. And we know that with poverty comes a host of health issues. So we see chronic health issues like diabetes and heart disease, but we also see serious, serious chronic issues around mental illness and substance abuse. And those two things are very much on display, particularly in a women's prison. There's three key factors that contribute to most women or girls going into the criminal justice system. We see them very, very consistently. Um, the first one is the experience of very serious trauma. So 80% of women and girls who are in the criminal justice system report having experienced sexual or other physical abuse in their personal histories, sometimes over a long period of time, sometimes one significant traumatic effect. But that is really consistent. Almost every woman or girl in the system has been through that. Um, and the two other really consistent factors that we see for women and girls, also for men in the system, but even more so for women and girls, are mental health problems, mental, health, mental illness, and substance abuse. And sometimes, obviously, those things relate to each other. So that was really apparent to me just experiencing incarceration because our prisons and jails are filled with people who, are, who have struggled with substance abuse in their life and who are struggling with mental illness while they're incarcerated. And the three biggest deliverers of mental health care in this country are Rikers Island here in New York City, the Cook County Jail, and the Los Angeles County Jail. That's, if you want to know where the majority, the largest number of people are getting mental health care in this country, it's in those three facilities. I personally think that's a mistake, that we, re we basically relied on the criminal justice system to deliver these health care um, services, which are really, really important and make incredibly dramatic changes and effects on people's lives. But you know, if you ask anyone who works in corrections, one of the biggest complaints uh, and very valid complaints of people who work in corrections is that corrections officials, whether you're talking about a correctional officer, whether you're talking about a warden or you know, another staffer, by and large, you know, they didn't get into corrections to deliver mental health services. And often it's not, I mean, more and more it is part of their training just by necessity, but it's really not intended to be part of the core job responsibility for people who work in prisons and jails. It's a real serious problem. Um, and that's something that people on both sides of the fence, whether you're talking about prisoners or whether you're talking about the people who run prisons, can often agree on. Um, I saw that clear as day amongst the women that I was doing time with. And so uh, it was pretty heartbreaking in a lot of senses because what takes place in a prison is generally a lot of medication and not that much other sort of therapeutic effort towards addressing those problems because prisons and jails first priority is security. So they rely heavily on things like medication for the health problems that they must treat. And that has, you know, a, a somewhat limited remedy for the women who are struggling with those problems. And you see folks really struggle because the conditions of incarceration rarely make mental health issues better. They generally make it worse. They generally make those illness and all of the behaviors around that worse. And it's really difficult for some people who struggle with mental illness to do the basic things that the institution requires, like follow the rules. 
And that begins this sort of spiral of despair where you break the rules, so you get sanctions, and you get put in the shoe, and something like solitary confinement really doesn't make mental, doesn't make anybody um, more mentally healthy, but if you're already struggling with mental health issues, it has a particularly um, intense negative effect. And so those things, you, you watch those things go down and transpire um, in real life and in very, very close quarters. So, you know, in a prison or a jail, our prisons and jails are stuffed to capacity and way over capacity generally. So you're living right on top of one another. So, you know, you really have to contend with the health issues of the people who are living there with you. So, you know, when I think about B dorm where I lived and, you know, Miss Pat, who is this elderly lady, who I don't know exactly what her, her diagnosis was, but she would go through these very predictable, in a lot of senses, cycles of illness, where she would become sicker and sicker and more and more anxious, you know, do things like go try to clean the bathrooms at four o'clock in the morning. You know, you'd go be in, you know, the other prisoners would be in there sort of begging her to go back to bed. You know, she's a good example of somebody who really, really struggled in that setting. Um, leaving aside those sort of uh, persistent or chronic health problems, you also see really interesting things and frightening things in prison and jail settings like watching pandemics spread really quickly. So I was sent to prison in February uh, of 2004, and that's flu season, right? And just about a month after I got there, a really nasty flu hit. So everybody was going down to the, to the infirmary to get you know, their green pills. You really actually have no idea what the medication they're giving you is. But it is astonishing to watch how quickly something like a flu epidemic sweeps through an institution which is so crowded. Um, they are set up in some ways to treat that, but it is really devastating. And I remember being like, oh, I'm, I'm going to fight this one off. I'm going to fight this one off. And I, I maintained my health for about a month. And then at the, I, was, I was sort of in the last group of people who fell to that flu. And it was a terrible, I mean, it was one of those really bad flus for any of you who've had a flu that put you in bed for over a week. So there's a host of health issues that are sort of front and center um, in any prison and jail setting and some things that are very unique to women and girls who go into the system. Um, so I touch on health issues in this book. Um, the last health issue that I'll talk about a little bit and then I'll just open it up to questions is the question of reproductive health. And so for women and girls in the system, I mentioned already sort of their experience of assault. Um, in every single prison and jail that I was in, there were pregnant women. And I'll never forget the first day that I self-surrendered in prison. You know, I went through the process of, uh, you know, being processed in, which means they, you know, take everything away. They strip search you, take away all your stuff, issue you, your, you know, they transform you into a prisoner, give you your uniform, you know, your pillow, your blanket. And then I was going to be put into general population. And I remember I got out of the van to go into the prison building and there were a bunch of women outside of the building. It was February, it was cold. And I saw a woman who was, you know, hugely pregnant. She was eight months pregnant. And I just remember being so confused. I was like, what is she doing here? I don't even understand. And that young woman ended up being, you know, the first person that I ever saw in labor. And I, and I talk a little bit in the book about, you know, uh, observing that happen, you know, how sort of the community of prisoners responded to that. What happens to most women who give birth while they are incarcerated is that they're taken out of the prison, they're brought to the local hospital or other you know, medical provider. Um, in more than 30 states in this country, women who are in labor are shackled while they're in labor, which is a really barbaric process, a really barbaric uh, practice. It's really shocking, actually, when you talk to people who are not American and and you talk about the fact that we do that to pregnant women, they sort of can't believe it. Um, but 18 states have passed laws banning shackling in labor um, and ba banning the shackling of, of you know, very pregnant women. Um, most women give birth and are brought right back to the prison and the baby is either taken by their family or goes into the foster care system or is put up for adoption. Um, it's a really devastating thing. And here's the thing that I would emphasize about women in prison particularly. 
overwhelmingly, they're in prison for nonviolent crimes. More than 60% of women in prison, women and girls in the system, are there for nonviolent crimes. Great question. If anyone didn't hear it, it was basically a question about reentry and how can someone be successful at reentry, particularly given that there are many barriers to success, including one of the most important is employment. How, it's extremely difficult for people who have a felony record to get employment. I would say that is the number one thing that you know, people get in touch with me who have been incarcerated, you know, they email me or they tweet me just like you do. And that is probably the number one thing that people ask me about or, you know, talk to me about or, you know, just struggle with. Um, it's a really serious problem. Um, the barriers to coming home successfully and, you know, leading a legal life are really consistent. Like, we know exactly what they are. Some of them are health related. So someone is released from prison or jail. They may have a mental illness issue. They may have chronic chronic health problems, but they are basically leaving a healthcare system and coming back to the outside world. They may have had access to Medicaid or Mer Medicare previous to being locked up, but generally the criminal justice system severs their enrollment in those systems, so they have to go around about getting re-enrolled, which is sometimes really challenging for people who are frankly living in crisis. Um, so there's health issues. There's housing issues for women especially. Uh, housing issues are really problematic for all folks coming home from prison and jail, but especially for women because the majority of women in the, prison, in the criminal justice system are mothers, and the majority of the women who are mothers are the mothers of minor children. So in other words, children under the age of 18. Most women who go into the criminal justice system had primary responsibility for their children before they got locked up. And children of a mother who is locked up, as opposed to a father who is locked up, are five times more likely to go into the foster care system. What that all means is that for women who come home from prison, they are particularly focused on regaining their parental rights, often, not always, but often. And so housing plays a really, really big role in that. Because you, know, you all live here in New York, or you know, somewhere in New York, you know how expensive it is to live in New York City. So if you're trying to regain custody of your children, you need to have an apartment that is large enough to satisfy children's and family services. So let's say you have three children, you need to have a four bedroom apartment. Not cheap in New York. So those issues of housing, you know, totally separate from those issues of you know, women and motherhood, you know, housing in many communities where folks might be returning is expensive. Let's say you lived in public housing before you were sent to prison. You cannot live in prison in a public housing if you have a felony record. Nor can you stay with a family member in public housing if you have a felony record. So a lot of barriers in housing. So that's health, housing. I always talk about sort of family and you know friends, the personal networks that you have because. I think that is the number one predictor of success or failure when someone is coming home. What kind of network are they coming home to? Is their family position ready for them? Is their family positioned for them to come home? Are they, are the, is the family willing and able to offer help and support? And also, do they have a wider network you know, outside of their family in addition to their family? So for me personally, that was everything. I came home to a, a wonderful man who was waiting for me, and he had a safe and stable place for me to live. And I had a friend who was able to create a job for me. So those personal relationships were so essential for all those other things that I needed, like a job, a stable place to live, you know, my health. In, the, in this case, I got health care via my job. Um, Absent those things, that's where people very predictably struggle um, and stumble when they come home. So um, one of the things that I think is really important to remember about the prison system and the jail system is that there are too many things that fray that network. You know, It's really hard for many families to visit their loved ones who are incarcerated because some, you know, Newark is a good example. Most people who are sent to prison in, this, in New York come from you know, the, the downstate area, come from New York and the surrounding area. They get sent really, really far upstate. 
And actually, the New York correctional system has had this theory of like, OK, we're going to send you way upstate. And if you behave, then we'll gradually move you further south, closer to your family. But that's a really destructive approach because you know, empirical studies show that the connections that a prisoner is able to maintain to the outside world contribute a great deal to whether or not they will recidivate, whether they will commit another crime and go back to prison. <laughs> um, so those are just a few things. It was a great question, and I went on at great length about reentry. But that job thing is so, so important, and, and even more so for guys than for women. Um, that's the thing that so many str struggle with, because guys come home and they want to make enough money to support their family and like be a man. And a lot of the jobs that are open to them are very, very low wage and sometimes really low prestige. And guys struggle with that. So there's been some progress, though. Um, Target is the first really, really big corporation in this country to do something which is called banning the box. So on their job application, they have taken off the question about whether you have a felony conviction. Because generally what we find is that on a job application, if someone checks the box and says, yes, I have a felony conviction, that job application goes into the circular file of the trash bag. right? So that is, that is a hopeful thing. That is progress. Because I return to the point that when we build up our criminal justice system so it is so huge, when we start incarcerating so many people, you suddenly have millions and millions of people in this country who have felony records. <laughs> and so that question of like, how, how can these folks gain employment? How can they overcome those, those very serious obstacles to leading a legal life is really important for all of us, not just for those individuals and their families. Thanks. That's a good question. Long answer. Uh, I'll describe, not to go, I know this is not a pre-law class, but I'll describe something simply which has been really, really relevant to drug sentencing. So a really big part of the reason that we have grown from 500,000 people in prison in 1980 to 2.3 million people in prison today is our drug laws. That was a really, really big policy change. We started sending people to prison that we would not have sent to prison previously and we started sending them to prison for really long periods of time. So 10 ounces of crack cocaine, this is a 12 ounce bottle, so like less than this, still gets you, there's been some reforms around crack cocaine sentencing, still gets you a 10 year minimum sentence in this country, which is a lot of time considering that I know people who have committed, you know, I, I, you can read all kinds of stories of people committing very violent felonies and getting less time than that, right? So that's a really big change. One of the ways that the government approaches prosecuting drug offenses is something called criminal conspiracy. So in my case, for example, there's 13 people on my indictment. At the top of my indictment is a drug kingpin who li who's overseas, and at the bo bottom of my indictment is me. Everyone on that indictment will get sentenced based on the same drug weight, which is what determines the length of your sentence. So that's very daunting for someone like myself who had minimal involvement for a really short time. Because I have no valuable information to give up to the government, right? I don't have any big revelations that are going to help them um, catch more crooks. <laughs> so uh, that's, I mean, that sort of horse trading is the reality of how sentences get negotiated, though. And 95% of all criminal defendants plead guilty. Almost no one goes to trial. So you know, what we see on TV often is like the full trial with the jury and the judge and the whole thing. It very rarely happens. 95% of people plead guilty and are sentenced either to prison or to probation or whatever that is. So um, it makes a really, really big difference. And so lots of public defenders are fantastic lawyers. They're really good lawyers. But the average public defender in this country carries a felony caseload of 400, of a minimum of 400 cases, which is far above what's recommended. So what does that translate into? 400 cases a year. Let's hope they get two weeks of vacation. How much time are they spending on those cases? Not very much, right? So I was able to pay my lawyer. I was able to hire you know, a really good lawyer, a private lawyer. You know, and I, I was also able to call my friend who is like clerking at a federal judge and say, I need help finding a lawyer. So just that, I mean, what if any of you were accused of a crime? You would want a lawyer right away, right? How would you go about hiring one? 
Yeah, for most of it, it, it it's a total head scratcher. So, and, and my lawyers were able to spend a lot of time on my case because I had the ability to pay. So all those kinds of privileges, those socioeconomic privileges, are really, really important. And I hope it's easy to see that that delivers a really different quality of justice to one woman versus another woman. And literally, the day I started serving my sentence, you know, I go into prison, I'm scared, I'm not feeling too good about this. And after just a few hours in Gen Pop, you know, the, the one sort of acceptable icebreaker is, how much time do you have? And so I have my 15-month sentence, which will equal 13 months with good time off good, for good behavior. And I'm talking to other women, and they're doing seven years, and they're doing 10 years, right? They're doing much longer sentences than me. And over time, as I got to know these women really well, because you're living, you know, cheek to cheek in, you know, these crowded prison cells, I was pretty convinced that there could not possibly be a big difference between my crime and their crime in terms of seriousness. Like, you know, these women were not murderers. These women were not bank robbers, even. Uh, they were low-level drug offenders like me. So you have to draw the conclusion that my one-year sentence versus their seven-year sentence had a lot to do with socioeconomic status and, in some cases, racial privilege you know, as they go through the criminal justice system. And that's something to think about really seriously, because the one place that we expect that everyone will be equal is in a court of law, but that's not really what we see happen. So. You know, I don't actually know about adoption. Um, regaining those parental rights is a very, very important thing for a lot of women. And so it varies state by state how quickly your parental rights are terminated. In New York, they used to be terminated very quickly. We actually passed a reform a year or two ago which made some improvements on that. In other words, it gave the mom more time and more ability to maintain her parental rights. Um, so I can't answer the question about adoption, but the question about sort of maintaining custody and parental rights with your children is generally that most women who do more than a couple years are going to see those parental rights terminated or curtailed and that they will have to go into the family court system in order to get those rights back. It is possible, but it's not easy. And again, we're often talking about folks who have you know, many other concerns in terms of making a living and getting food in their mouth and so on and so forth and shelter over their head. And sometimes also not that much education. The majority of people in prison have not completed their high school diploma. And so dealing with a court system is intimidating. Believe me, for, I don't know if any of you have had any experience with any of the court systems, family court, civil court, et cetera, it's very intimidating, even if you have a college degree and are well educated. And so dealing with a court system is a real challenge, even if it's not the criminal court system. Um, so folks often ask, were you writing the book while you were in prison? And the answer is no. So I didn't decide to write the book until after I came home from prison. Um, the experience of incarceration is very indelible. So the memories are very vivid. Um, and I have a good memory, but no one could write as much detail as is in here. Um, I kept a journal very occasionally, but actually if you go back and read through it, you're like, wow, she's really upset. I realized that I only wrote in the journal when I was really upset about something. <laughs> it was not sort of a daily, like, this is what I did, or I, today was not such a bad day. Um, when I decided to write the book in earnest, here is what I wrote constantly, letters. I was so lucky, back to that sort of that network of people who are on the outside who are pulling for you, which means so much to every prisoner, to know that there's even one person on the outside who has a stake in their success makes a huge difference. And so I had folks who were writing me letters, and believe me, if someone writes you a letter in prison or jail, you will write them back. <laughs> and so I had all these letters that I had written to my friends. And so when I decided to write the book in earnest, most of my friends had saved those letters that I had written to them. And they photocopied them and they sent them back to me. And I put them, I have this one binder, which is sort of, uh, I think of it as my primary source binder that has all of, um, all of the primary source documents that I use to write the book, whether it's the handbook from the prison or some of the paperwork, but also these letters. And so I put them in a chronological order, and I was really amazed as I read through them how much, I mean, what I was trying to do in those letters was to convey to my people on the outside uh, what, kind, what the world that I was living in was like, which of course is exactly what I was trying to do in the book. 
So those letters were the single most invaluable thing when it came to writing the book. And in some cases, you know, there's stuff verbatim from the letters that ended up in the book. In, and the other thing that those letters did is provide, you know, a lot of detail. And also that chronology was really important to me. I was very concerned as I was writing this book that it be sort of unimpeachable. You know, I felt nervous. I think any memoirist probably feels nervous that, you know, someone will be like, oh, that's not true. You made that up or you're lying. Given the, nat given the subject matter and the nature of the book, I was particularly nervous about that. So I remember when I wrote my first draft, I wrote it literally in, you know, month by month. I mean, and uh, I got a note back from my editor to that first draft which said, I, I think here you're trying to depict the tedium of prison and you're doing a pretty good job. <laughs> so it took some revisions to get to the final draft. But, um, but yeah, the, those things were really important to me. Um, the, the dialogue, you know, the, there is a fair amount of dialogue, you know, conversation that is depicted. That is from memory. So, you know, it's not that I had, I, I didn't have a tape recorder there. But, you know, the, the placement of time, like the events in time, you know, I totally stand by all of that in this book. Yes, yes. Not with all of them, because obviously I lived with literally hundreds and hundreds of women while I was incarcerated. But there are a number of women, so Rosemary, Pop, Little Janet, Jay, uh, Yoga Janet, you know, all those women are still in my life, and I really treasure those friendships. Um, People sometimes ask me if there's anything I miss about prison, and I'm like, no. <laughs> but I mi you know, the only thing I miss is people, you know, and those friendships were what sustained me and helped me survive the experience of incarceration, and I think that's true for anyone who goes through it. And you know, it's this struggle. There's this very common saying in every prison of, you walk in alone and you walk out alone. Like, there's this whole ethos of, like, you have to be really tough. And you know what? You do have to be tough. Like, prisons are not nice places. And, you know, you have to be careful about, like, who you trust, who you don't, whether you're talking about staff or whether you're talking about other prisoners. But those friendships are, they are what gets you through. And so I am just incredibly grateful that I have those women in my life. Just almost everyone that I know from prison has come home. A couple of people have gone back, which is tragic and heartbreaking. Um, certainly all those people that I just mentioned have read the book. Um, lots and lots of people who are in Danbury with me have read the book and have, if they weren't in touch with me already, have been in touch. And I've gotten really great feedback to the book. And you know, interestingly, I've gotten less feedback to the show. I mean, all of those folks have seen the show. And they, for them, I think it's a funny viewing experience because it's so different, right? The show is very different from the book. And I think that they like the show. I mean, one woman was like, oh, the show gave me flashbacks. Because, you know, one of the things that I really like about the show that I think they did a good job is the creation of the atmosphere, like the setting of the prison in Litchfield is, I think, very realistic if you want to depict a minimum security women's you know, prison camp. Um, some of the characters, you know, they, you know, they either roll their eyes, you know, like Yoga Janet is a good example. Yoga Janet said, that actress doesn't know how to do yoga. <laughs> but, um, but they've been really, you know, enthusiastic and good humored, especially, you know, about the book. And I think they're very excited to see so much attention paid to the issues that are present, both in the book and in the show. Um, because, again, Prisons and jails are hidden away from view, usually. And prisoners, and even people who work in the prison system, want to be seen. So one of the most surprising things about the book and the show has been the response from people who work in corrections and law enforcement, which are the last people that I expected to like it. But you know, when I visited Ohio in September, as I was telling you, I visited that men's, security, men's prison, and there were like some of the COs there were like, we love the show. And I was like, really? <laughs> but then uh, I visited the largest women's prison in Ohio, 2,500 women, and the warden was like, I think the show is great. It's the most realistic show I've ever seen about prison. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> so uh, yeah, sobering. There are lots of things that any individual person or collectively people can do. Um, and it's all about like what you most want, what you're most interested in, and what you're most comfortable with. So anybody, and you, I think all of you are over 18, right? So all of you are, I hope, registered voters. 
And anyone can get in touch with their elected officials and let them know that they would like things done in a more sensible way when it comes to the criminal justice system. So the way that I think about it is letting elected officials know that we want common sense when it comes to criminal justice as opposed to, you know, if you think about it, it's sort of, you know, if you're riding a bike or if you're driving a car and you're only using one gear, you're not really using the bike or the car very well. Right now, the criminal justice system pretty much just goes into the prison gear. They don't use any of the other options that we have for dealing with crime, especially low-level crime. So asking, asking and telling elected officials that you want more common sense approaches that, deal, that, that use incarceration less is very, very important because if they don't hear that, then they don't believe that, right? And what they care about is what their constituents want and what kind of political pressure they're getting. So they need both pressure, but they also need sort of political shade, if you will. They need cover. Um, they need to see that there's public desire for those things. So being in touch with, with whether you're talking about like the city council here in New York and saying stop, question, and frisk is putting too many young men into our system for very, very stupid reasons. And once, you ha once you're in the system, it's so hard to get out. And that's the thing that's really important to know about those really low level things is like once we put someone into the criminal justice system, it's really hard to get them out. It's like putting someone into a maze that has no exits. <laughs> so that's important. But on a totally different level, one thing that you can do is volunteer your time. And so there's a lot of different ways you can do. I think one of the most interesting things you can do is go into the prisons and the jails and volunteer your time. Because then you get at least part of a view into how those institutions work. But if you're not comfortable with that, you can volunteer your time here in New York with lots of great organizations. You know, I am on the board of the Women's Prison Association. Until recently, we had an office right acro directly across the street. Um, but we do all kinds of work with women and, children and their families. But there are also other great organizations like the Osborne Association, which also does a lot of work with, with families. Um, and the Correctional Association. All of those organizations have been in New York for a long, long time. The Women's Prison Association has been around since the 1840s. Um, and there's lots of different ways that you might volunteer your time with those folks. A lot of that entails working with folks who are returning home and, and trying to help them have a successful reentry, like, like you were asking about. So those are just a couple ways. And so a lot of it is just about your own comfort zone and what you're most interested in. But I will tell you something that People who volunteer in prisons and jails always say that they get more out of it than, than they ever expected and that it is a fascinating, fascinating place. So volunteering on a literacy program, you know, all those kinds of things are really great. And you'll have a first-hand view of what it's really like behind bars. So um, those are just a handful. Don't forget that political part, though. <laughs> You know, the truth of the matter is that there's probably way too much mail for them to actually read all of it. So what would happen in, pra in practical terms, let's say that I was suspected of bringing in contraband, they might, be pr they might be reading all my mail. But if I'm just a regular sort of run of the mill rank and file prisoner who's not really a problem, I mean, they open every single, because they want to open it up to make sure there's no contraband in the envelopes. But actually reading the contents, Probably not unless they sort of had their eye on you for some reason. So, thank you so much. yes, thank you.